so uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, webinar on striking the right balance for sustainable pest management uh, i am rakesh mishra uh, from tata institute for genetics and society and it's our pleasure to uh, welcome dr chandish balal and dr mudli mohan for their expert uh, uh, presentations uh, on this very important uh, uh, topic uh, as some of you may be knowing uh, tata institute for genetics and society that is based uh, uh, in bangalore in gkvk campus uh, addresses societal problems by using uh, high end technology and try to find solutions to those problems and the three major uh, programs that we are Uh, actively involved are uh, crop improvement, which includes uh, pest control, uh, infectious diseases, which includes uh, surveillance, AMR, and uh, vector control, and rare genetic diseases, in which we uh, try a lot of uh, social interaction, developing uh, affordable therapeutics and uh, uh, diagnostics for screening purposes. so today we are going to discuss uh, uh, the the huge problem of uh, pest control uh, from the agriculture point of view is one of the uh, big problem in the country the country where uh, agriculture provides livelihood to over 60% of indian population and uh, this sector is expected to generate better momentum for next few years due to increase in investment in agriculture infrastructure such as irrigation facilities crop improvement programs developing uh, warehouse and cold chain units and so on so which means we can uh, imagine uh, more activity but at the same time the insects uh, that are the pest pose a great challenge uh, an enhanced challenge to the sector as tropical climate conditions in india are ideal for continuous breeding uh also the productivity is threatened by the pest and uh, can also ruin the livelihood of uh, insect pest uh, if insect pests are not controlled uh, at the right time uh, to overcome these challenges farmers have opted for organic and inorganic pesticide which are uh, detrimental to humans and other livestock but they have no other options in india over 200 different pesticides are used in various combinations and concentrations and it is estimated that about 30000 crore worth of crops are destroyed by insect pest and therefore use of pesticide is inevitable but at the same time we know how harmful it is for the environment because all the insects are not our enemies and most of the insecticides are uh, agnostic to which uh, insect species they come in contact with so therefore agriculture scientists were advised are working on a biological alternatives to develop sustainable methods that can not only meet the increasing global demand for the food production but also conserve the ecosystem and ecological balance for the future generations and this webinar uh, we will discuss new strategies we have two uh, uh, experts who are very accomplished scientists in this area Uh, so they will discuss strategies currently in place in arms race between the humans and the insects so we are uh, looking forward to uh, today's deliberations we have the the way we are organized this is the first we will have two speakers and then we will have a question and answer session which will be moderated by my colleague dr sanpat kumar and uh, so our first speaker uh, is uh dr chandish balal is my pleasure to introduce introduce uh, dr balal uh, who has always led emphasis on environmental safety and sustainability by focusing her research effort on conservation of biodiversity and biological control in non chemical mode of insect pest control uh, she served as head of the division of insect ecology from 2013 to 2016 and the director of icr nbair from 2016 to 2020 dr balal made concerted effort to create 
awareness of the importance of a healthy environment and to popularize the concept of political control among all stakeholders as a director of the icr nbair and project coordinator of aicrp uh, on biological control she has made all out efforts to strengthen national and international networking to step up uh, taxonomic and biocontrol research in india uh, she is now part of uh, several uh, national research advisory committees of uh, icr institutes and tbt and government of india so it's my uh, pleasure to welcome dr balal for this uh, uh, in this webinar and uh, we are now look forward to your presentation dr balal please go ahead uh, thank you so much sir thank you for your uh, kind words respected uh, uh, dr mishra um and the uh, and uh, his colleagues at uh, TIGS, uh, Sampath, Sham, Savita, and all the other participants who are here. Um, I think uh, I should say that I am really honored that I have been uh, invited to give a talk on sustainable pest management. That is the broad theme um, for today's webinar. And uh, uh, I have chosen the topic, biological control, a panacea or puzzle. Um, under this topic, uh, though I'm sure that uh, all of you know what biological control means, uh, I felt that I should give a formal uh, beginning to this presentation. So biological control basically uh, deals with a strategy where you use living organisms, we call them as natural enemies in biological control, to manage insect pests, mites, diseases, weeds, etc. Now, the natural enemies which are used can be parasitoids, predators, they can be weed insects or even disease organisms. And what is done is it is introduced into the environment of the pest. And if already the natural enemy is there, if you do not have to introduce them, what we do under biological control is we come up with strategies to improve their performance or encourage their populations and thus we want to reduce the pest organism. So the major aim is to bring down chemical pesticide applications. And always in biological control, there is a human management role. Uh, but in the case of natural biological control, which is generally in forest ecosystems, where uh, the natural enemies try to bring down the population of pests without any human intervention. Now, broadly, uh, I would like to speak about the different uh, biocontrol agents which are used to target insect pests. And I am not going into the uh, plant diseases because it's too huge a topic. I'm only concentrating on insect pests right now. And uh, for managing insect pests, biocontrol agents can be microbials or microbials. Under microbials, we have the parasitoids, we have the predators, and also we have the weed insects which are used for controlling weeds. Under microbials, we have the entomopathogenic organisms, which can be fungal organisms or viral or bacteria. And I have uh, um, put the nematodes with a different uh, uh, color, primarily because some of the researchers consider nematodes as microbials, but uh, broadly we can call them as microbials, but they are a kind of a microbial with a difference. And the formulated uh, microbials are called biopesticides. Now, uh, broadly, the biocontrol approaches are three. One is the conservation biocontrol, where primarily uh, we aim to conserve the natural enemies by avoiding chemical insecticides or uh, coming up with a diverse crop habitat or using semiochemicals, which can encourage natural enemies, or you should manage the crop residue to uh, retain the populations of natural enemies, or you can even encourage eco-feast crops. Classical biological control is the second approach where it is generally uh, adopted to tackle invasive pests. So here, what we do is we look for the biocontrol agents of, in the country of origin of the invasive pests. And then we import them and release into uh, the fields where the invasive pest is attacking, and thus we control the 
invasiveness. The third uh, approach is augmentation biocontrol, which is generally adopted to manage the indigenous pests, not the invasive pests, generally. And uh, you have these natural enemies in nature, but then the population of these natural enemies is not adequate to control them. In such situations, we have to multiply the parasitoids or predators or the disease organisms and release them into the field. This is the augmentation drive control. Now, um, when I, I have given a title that biological control panacea or puzzle, I should uh, speak about the positive attributes of biological control. As you all know, it's healthy, it's a healthy approach. And there's no harvesting interval or waiting period, which has to be followed when you use chemical insecticides. And there is no phytotoxic damage on the plant. And we have generally seen that biological control becomes a success when chemical pesticides fail to perform or when there are no chemical pesticides available when a new invasive enters your country. So in such situations, we have seen biological control generally succeeds. Now, classical biological control, I told you about the, this approach, which is used to manage invasives. It isn't a holistic solution. Can we call it a panacea? Yes, it is a panacea for specific situations when we are trying to manage specific pests. Now, um, one of the oldest examples of classical biological control success is the management of the cottony cushion scale in California in 1888. Now, um, this particular pest was causing havoc and uh, the Vedalia ladybird beetle, this is the ladybird beetle, which was imported from New Zealand. It is called Rhodolia cardinalis. Now it is called Novius cardinalis because Rhodolia uh, is synonymized uh, under Novius. And uh, just five shipments of these beetles were obtained from New Zealand. And by 1890, the complete infestation by the cottony cushion scale was brought under control. Though the project cost around $1,500, the benefit was millions of dollars annually. Another example of classical biological control, to call it a panacea, the uh, weed Salvinia molesta, a notorious weed, uh, it was first recorded in Kerala. And uh, this particular weevil over here, which I have indicated, this is called Citrobagus salvini. This was imported and uh, it was released against this particular weed. And you can see the before and after release photographs over here. And this particular insect could control um, Salvinia molesta and the savings to the farmers was more than 100 lakhs per year. But currently, uh, another weed, that is water hyacinth, has displaced Salvinia. So there are problems, there are challenges. And one problem was solved and it was a success, but a new problem has come up. And it is mentioned in Kerala that this has happened due to the floods in Kerala. Now, one of the more recent examples of classical biocontrol success is in 2008, Paracoccus marginatus, that is the papaya mealy bug, was first reported in Coimbatore. And it was a major problem on papaya and mulberry, though several other host plants were there. And three parasitoids were imported, Esrophagus papaya, and Agairus loci and Pseudoleptomastix mexicana. And this was obtained with the help of USDA APHIS, and it was obtained from Puerto Rico. And it was released, and Esrophagus papaya performed the best, and it controlled this particular pest in all the states where papaya millibug infestation was recorded, and the savings was around 1,500 crore Indian rupees. Now, recently, what we have a finding is, the Pseudoleptomastix mexicana, which was not a very active parasitoid earlier, in some pockets, like in Salem, it seems to be performing well. So there are some variations which keep happening. Now, this is a beautiful example of classical biocontrol in Australia. Now, this example indicates why networking between different countries or different organizations is important for biological control success. Now, um, in Australia, the Christmas Island National Park, in this particular national park, um, the red crabs are really an attraction. Now, the yellow crazy ant was 
uh, attacking the red crabs and it was kind of totally reducing its population. Now, the yellow crazy ant, um, it has a mutualistic association with the scale insect, as you can see. Now, what the researchers did was, instead of directly attacking the yellow crazy ant, they found a parasitoid to attack the scale insect, thus brought down the population of the scale insect, which automatically led to the reduction in population of the yellow crazy ant. Now, this is a beautiful example of classical biological control and the way different organizations came together to bring about the success, where in Malaysia, Australia, the general public all came together to work on this particular strategy. Now, um, to move on to conservation by control successes, one of the most notable successes in India was when attempts were made to control the invasive sugarcane woolly aphid. See, I said generally for invasive pests, we import exotic natural enemies. But here is a case where when this particular pest caused havoc in different states like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, etc. in 2003-04, the indigenous natural enemies which existed in India, like one parasitoid, Encarcia flavoscutellum, and two predators, Dipha and Micromus, immediately found this particular pest to be a target host and they started attacking this pest. Automatically, the population started coming down. So all that biocontrol workers did was to advise the farmers to abstain from the use of chemical insecticides. When this was done, automatically the population of natural enemies increased and the pest population was brought down. So this is a beautiful example of conservation by control. Moving on to augmentation by control, in the greater Mekong sub-region, for the management of rice pests, trichogamma cards, I think you all must be familiar with that. These are cards which are used. They contain tiny parasitized eggs from which the parasitoids come out and attack the egg stage of lepidopteran pests, that is moth pests. Now, um, several organizations came together, like Iri Philippines, Tiani Biocontrol Company from China, and CABI in Switzerland, China, and Malaysia, and the Institute of Plant Protection, Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences. All of them came together. There was huge funding, and 11 trichogramma rearing facilities were set up in GMS, which was uh, considered a great achievement. Uh, understanding that people are generally very hesitant to take up production of trichogrammatids. Now, here we have an example, a similar example from India, but this happened without any huge funding. In Kerala, the biocontrol-based IPM was taken up. And in Kerala, as you all may be knowing, they have the group farming concept, wherein groups of farmers get together and they call these groups as partashikrams. And the state agriculture department is the Krishi Bhavan. Now in Kerala, due to excessive use of chemical pesticides, the bio, there was a clear decline in biodiversity and there was a decline in uh, yield also because of um, uh, excessive uh, chemical pesticide use and pests developing uh, resistance and um, infesting the crops. Now um, NBAIR, Kerala Agriculture University, uh, state by control laboratory from Manuti and all these Patashekarams, the Krishi Bhavan and Farmers Cooperative Bank came together and uh, trico cards were produced and uh, pseudomonas for uh, paddy diseases were also produced and this was provided to the farmers and the result was a revival of lost diversity and the yield was up to 6.5 metric tons per hectare. So this was a, a great achievement. Uh, and again, this indicates that a networking is essential. Now, I spoke briefly about microbials, that is parasitoids and predators. To look at microbials, microbials can be fungal pathogens. They can be virus like nucleopolyhedrosis virus. They can be bacteria like Bacillus thuringiensis. Fungus can be Metarhizium anisopliae or Bueria bassiana or Lacanicillium lacani. But the, uh, the hurdle here is that if you have to formulate this and use it commercially in the field, you have to get them registered under the 
Central Insecticide Board. So this is a hurdle because you have to generate toxicology data, which is very expensive. So this is a hurdle in as far as microbials go. Now, entomopathogenic nematodes. Nematodes can also be used for controlling insect pests. Now, I call it a microbial with a difference for two reasons. Number one, the mode of action. Here, the nematodes, they seek their host, that is the pest. They get into the host and then they release a bacteria within the host, which kills the host through bacterial septicema. Now, this is an image of how entomopathogen infected host looks like. Now, the production of entomopathogenic nematodes can be in vivo or in vitro. Uh, through fermenters or solid medium, or it can be using the host insect, Galeria melonella. Now, this technology, I said, I feel it's a different technology, number one, uh, because a wettable powder formulation has been developed by the scientists of NBAR for management of root grubs using the entomopathogenic nematode. Now, another advantage with respect to this particular organism is that this technology could be passed on to several commercial companies so that they could upscale and supply to the farmers, primarily because this is exempted from CNBRC registration. So the cost involved in toxicology data, et cetera, is not uh, there for this particular organism. Now, why do I call biological control a puzzle during certain situations? I'm giving, explaining this with a couple of examples. The spiraling whitefly Eleurodicus disperses entered our country in 1995. Uh, they were first reported uh, in Kerala. And uh, we were aware that a parasitoid called Encarcia hytiensis was imported into Maldives for the management of this particular pest, that is spiraling whitefly. Hence, the scientists from PDBC, NBR was then called PDBC, they conducted a survey in the Lakshadweep Islands, which is close, close to Maldives, thinking that they could collect Encarcia hytiensis. But what they found was that in Lakshadweep, a parasitoid called Encarcia gudalope has been um, fortuitously in introduced. So what was done was this parasitoid was brought into the mainland India and released against the spiraling whitefly and it established. And the puzzling part that this particular parasitoid was imported or brought into mainland for the management of spiraling whitefly. But then recently in 2016, when the Rugo spiraling whitefly entered our country and was creating havoc in the coconut plantations and uh, oil palm plantations, this particular parasitoid automatically started finding Rugo spiraling whitefly also as a suitable host and started parasitizing. So the farmers were advised to conserve this parasitoid by minimizing chemical insecticides. And one more uh, potential organism was Isaria fumoserosia, a local indigenous uh, microbial fungal uh, pathogen, which, was, which could also be used against the rugospiraline whitefly. So it was a combination of the parasitoid and a microbial, again for an invasive. Now that was the puzzling part that something which was introduced for a particular pest also uh, found another pest suitable to parasitize. Now, another example from Alberta, the amber-marked birch leaf miner, which is called Profineusa thompsoni. Now, this particular pest uh, population was very high, causing havoc uh, in birch, but the population crashed within two years of its invasion. And there were three parasitoids which were responsible for this crashing of the population. Two of the parasitoids, Latherolestis thompsoni and Latherolestis soperi, they were of unknown origin. They had just accidentally entered into the country. And there was one native parasitoid, Eptesis cygnus, which also was responsible for reducing the population. So here, the interesting or puzzling uh, fact is that even the indigenous natural enemies can attack an invader. So we have to look into the indigenous natural enemies before we think of importing any exotic natural enemy. So an example from India, uh, when the invasive pest Podoptera frugipara, the fall army worm, was first reported in May 2018, we looked at literature and we found that two egg parasitoids are generally recommended globally for fall army worm management, that is trichogramma pretiosum and uh, telenomus remus. 
But then we had both these parasitoids in our uh, repository at NBAIR. However, we started searching for the different parasitoids which are there in nature, which must be uh, responsible, uh, which could target fall armyworm. We found that several parasitoids or, and predators in India were attacking this new invasive pest. And uh, out of that, the most interesting were these two egg parasitoids, Trichogramma chelonis and Telenomus remus. Now here, I want to speak about the interesting aspect in this. Trichogramma chelonis is actually an indigenous parasitoid. Now this parasitoid found uh, fall armyworm as a very interesting host to parasitize and control, which is, which is very advantageous for us. Number two, this parasitoid Telenomus remus, about two decades ago or more than that, we had imported this for management of Spodoptera litura. Now, it had never established, it was found that it is not a good agent for management of Spodoptera litura. But then when fall armyworm entered the country and we were randomly picking up patches of four eggs, we found that Telenomus remus, we don't know where it was sitting all these years, but then we found eggs which were parasitized by Telenomus remus. Again, indicating native natural enemies can uh, interestingly find invasive pests suitable for parasitism. Now, fall fall armyworm, since we knew that there are some good parasitoids for the egg stage, and we have excellent microbial isolates, a fungal pathogen isolate, Metarhizium 35, a Bt isolate, NBR Bt 25, and uh, NPV, nucleopolyhedrosis virus. Uh, I wish to tell you that uh, NPV has to be target specific. Uh, Metarhizium and Bt can have a host, wider host range, whereas NPV is generally specifically for the target pest. So even a Podoptera frugiperda specific NPV was isolated. So here we had a composite, a complete holistic approach where we had a nanopheromone for monitoring and mass trapping, egg parasitoids for attacking the egg stage, and a fungal pathogen, Bt, NPV for targeting the larval stage, and also two isolates of nematodes for targeting the larval stage. So we could choose the agent for the larval stage as per availability. Another interesting fact, which was uh, published by Orellana et al. 2016, uh, generally, we say entomopathogenic nematodes are meant for root grubs or uh, primarily for root grubs or borers. But here was an example where entomopathogenic nematode was used uh, in a tomato ecosystem and it could attack Spodoptera exigua, that is um, the armyworm, beet armyworm, and it um, uh, impaired the egg laying, the egg hatch of the white fly, and it also reduced the lesion formation by a bacterial pathogen, which means it could boost the plant immunity of uh, tomato. So three, it had a three-pronged approach when EPN was used. Now, uh, there are studies which indicate that the puzzling results could also be due to strainal variations. Now, strains are also developed in certain institutes, like for example, in NBAIR, two strains of trichogramma were um, developed in the laboratory uh, to be pesticide tolerant and high temperature tolerant. And some isolates which are collected from nature uh, seem to be more potential than the uh, others. That is, for example, a uh, entomopathogenic nematode isolate was found to perform on par with pesticides for root grub management. Now, this is a beautiful example which indicates it's not only the strainal variation in the natural enemies, the strainal variation in the pest also can determine the success of a biocontrol strategy. Uh, for the management of the rhinoceros beetle, the um, uh, virus, insect virus was used. It was a classical biocontrol approach where it was imported and it was used in many sites like in Fiji, Mauritius, Papua New Guinea, etc. Within one and a half years, the uh, virus established in the field and the population was brought down. But then after 40 years, there was an increased severity in some of the regions like Papua New Guinea, and Guam, etc. 
Now, the reason was because the pest, the coconut rhinoceros beetle in Guam was found to be a particular strain which was tolerant to the virus. So we have to understand that strainal variations can exist in the case of pests as well as in the natural enemies. One example of unsolved puzzles also can, ex uh, can exist. I'm giving you a single example of a parasitoid called Cotacea flavipus. This is a larval parasitoid which attacks sugarcane and maize borers. Now, is it a promising parasitoid or is it an one? That is what I, um, you know, look at it as. Now, this parasitoid was imported into Brazil and uh, it has proved to be extremely successful in managing sugarcane borers in Coca River Valley and also in Brazil, where the infestation range was brought down tremendously. Now, this part, same parasitoid was used in East and South Africa, where the populations were collected from Pakistan and different parts of India and released in different regions in uh, East and South Africa. And uh, it was found that by 2005, it had established in all the regions except one region that is Eritrea. And it was also established in Ethiopia, this parasitoid, this is the one. And uh, it was not released there. What is the reason? This was puzzling. And another uh, uh, finding was that generally we say when you release, if you have a large diversity, the chances of establishment is more. And when you release from a small colony, establishment cannot happen. But then here, the Sindh population from Pakistan, whatever was released in Kenya coast, also established. And the diverse population from, from the whole of central India, which was released, also established. However, it took nearly four to five years for establishment. Why so? And uh, another thing is, is this parasitoid having any specific strain and variation with respect to preference for particular host? Like diatria is the sugarcane pest and chylopatellus is the maize pest. Now, does it have a specific preference for between these two hosts? Or is there a specific preference for the host plants? like more preference for maize and sorghum than for sugarcane. In fact, in India also, we find that in maize, the uh, natural parasitism is higher, whereas in sugarcane, it is very low. So what we did was we imported the Indonesian strain of Cotacea flavipus, thinking that it would perform well on sugarcane. But then we did not get any uh, conclusive results. So there is a need to look at the population and strains of Cotacea flavipus from different host ecosystems from different crop ecosystems to understand why these strainal variations exist. Now, there are certain challenges and concerns in the case of microbials availability of the host and the parasitoid cultures, long term storage of trichocards and the release strategies. Now, though NBR has a huge repository and the technology for production of microbials as well as macrobials, we have all these parasitoids, we have all these wonderful predators, and we have anthocorid predators, we have the technology for production of predatory mites, but why commercial uptake is not happening? Now in other countries, there are excellent commercial producers of microbials like copper, BioB, BioBest in different countries. And this has to happen in our country. This is the main constraint. And for long storage of trichocards, this is a constraint which uh, prevents commercial units uh, from taking up trichogramma production. So under a DBT project, uh, we came up with a technology for long-term storage of trichocards by inducing diapause in trichogramma in the pre-pupal stage of trichogramma. So this we have published. I have given the references here. Now, another uh, uh, concern is regarding application. Now, drone application is one which can really solve this issue for releasing trichogramma and biopesticides. Now, I'm happy to share that most of you must have read that uh, SOPs are now available for drone application in our country. This is a publication uh, which has been released by the government of India. Now, in the case of microbials, what are the constraints? Long-term storage and registration. Registration because we have to generate bioefficacy and toxicology data, which is very expensive. Now, the concerns, the major concern in biological control, which is expressed by even researchers, is the non-target effect. There are publications which say that there are unexpected levels of non-target effect. 
Now I call it the bad side of few good agents. One example is the Asian ladybird beetle, Homonia axiridis, which was imported into the United States, released, but they found that it was displacing the native uh, wonderful ladybird beetles. So this was even causing a nuisance by overwintering in the attics of houses. And another uh, uh, moth, a uh, weed insect, which was imported to manage the invasive uh, cacti started attacking the native cacti and almost bringing them to the stage of ex extinction. So this indicates that it is very important to do uh, quarantine testing before releasing any biocontrol agent into the field. Now, how do we address challenges? There was this example where for managing Parthenium histrophorus, that is the Parthenium weed, Zygogramma bicolorata was introduced into our country. Now, in some areas, we found that sugarcane, I mean, uh, sunflower was attacked by Zygogramma, but a project was brought into uh, place and it was found that the preference was not high on sunflower and continuous feeding led to retardation and growth and reproduction of this beetle. But this uh, zygogramma has its own problems because it's not able to feed on the seeds and flowers. In Parthenium, it's very important to feed on the seeds and flowers because reproduction and spread is very high uh, due to the huge production of seeds. So recently uh, at NBAAR, another insect that is Micronix lutilentis, this was introduced because it's a seed feeder and this has happened due to excellent international collaboration with Australian organizations. Now to popularize biocontrol, that's a great challenge in front of us. I think the best model is to follow the Brazilian model where they are having their own model, which can be adapted in the tropical regions. And in 9 million hectare of sugarcane, they are covering around 3.5 million hectare with Cotasia and nearly 2 million hectare with Trichogramma. So that's the kind of biocontrol which is in practice in Brazil. Still, they have their own uh, constraints, but they are finding it very encouraging to see that larger companies are buying smaller businesses in uh, uh, Brazil. And they are clearly seeing that there is a mindset change in adoption of biocontrol by the farmers. So for India, national and international net networking is the key for strengthening biocontrol. And under national networking, I think I should say we have a strong AICRP biological control, which is in place, which has around 30 centers. But this AICRP biocontrol network should further network with other organizations and other crop AICRPs. International networking is extremely important, but that does that happen? One example of the invasive cassava mealybug, which is called Phenococcus manihoti. This, for managing this particular pest in Africa and Thailand, one parasitoid, which is called Anagyrus lopezi, was introduced. It was mass produced and it brought down the population of cassava mealybug tremendously. Now we know this success story. So when uh, cassava mealybug entered our country in 2020, in March, to be precise, March 2020, um, it was identified by uh, my colleague then, Dr. Joshi, and we could in introduce Anagyrus lopezi from IITA Benin. The mass production has been standardized and the different states have been provided the cultures of this parasitoid, like mainly for Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu. This parasitoid is expected to uh, control cassava millibug and we expect that there should be a success story very soon. Now, what is the regulatory hurdle for biological control? See, when we have to import any natural enemy, we need to get approvals and permits from the Directorate of Plant Protection, Quarantine and Storage. If we have to exchange or we have to provide biocontrol agents to a neighboring country, which is really in need of biocontrol agents, we have to get the approval of National Biodiversity Authority. If we have to use a biopesticide, we need to generate toxicology data. Now, this is the regulatory uh, procedure which has to be streamlined if biocontrol has to be more successful. Now, the take home message uh, briefly should be local isolates and native natural enemies are those which need a lot of attention, by, especially by young researchers who have taken a biocontrol as their area of research. And there is a very close link between biocontrol and taxonomy because you need to identify the pest and the natural enemies before taking up any strategy. There should be a perfect planning 
before choosing and releasing a bi control agent to avoid non target effects so a very strong quarantine study is essential very important uh, aspect is the national and international networking and we should expect unexpected failures and we should understand what has gone wrong and find ways to solve these problems and solve the puzzles so that we have more opportunities for success stories thank you so much for your patient hearing and uh, thank you uh, dr mishra for this opportunity thank you uh, thank you dr balal for very informative comprehensive and really stimulating uh, uh, talk and uh, i'm sure this is the way to go because we have to use the natural means of uh, eco balancing slightly in our favor when we are talking about agriculture and i think that's the way to go otherwise uh, other methods are not tenable so uh, thank you very much we will go for the next uh, presentation and then we'll take the questions there are several question i can see in the q and a box and more we add so uh, we will take all the questions after the uh, next presentation so uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, dr Uh, K. Murli Mohan. Uh, so, Dr. Mohan did his PhD in agriculture entomology from the uh, University of Agriculture and Sciences in Bangalore, and he worked at the Monsanto Research Center, Bangalore, where he established baseline susceptibility values for pink bollworm against uh, uh, Bt toxins. So, later at Monsanto, he worked uh, as a technical liaison between Monsanto and uh, their sub licenses to support them in fast tracking the commercialization of hybrids with the bt trades after a short stint in the industry he joined the uh, university of agriculture sciences as an assistant professor and initially worked in agricultural extension wing here he got drawn into adopting information and communication tools for agriculture extension Uh, a pilot project initiated by him regarding equipping farm extension officers with ICT platform for crop health management is now being implemented in entire state of Karnataka. Presently, uh, 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 he is working as a professor at the College of Agriculture, uh, University of Agriculture Sciences in GKVK uh, campus in Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Muli Mohan's research interests include understanding evolution of resistance in insects. to insecticide molecules and to uh, right toxin expressed in transgenic bt cotton and developing insecticide resistance management strategies so i look forward to uh, your presentation uh, at mohan please uh, you can share your presentation and start can you see my slides uh, yes you can go in presentation mode that Yeah, yeah, perfect. You are good. Yeah. To do that. yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon uh, to all of you and uh, Dr. Mishra. Thank you for that elaborate introduction. And at the outset, uh, I thank Tix uh, for this opportunity. And today I am going to talk about uh, the uh, possible repercussions of Rib technology, uh, a Rib strategy uh, which is used for management of resistance uh, on uh, GM crops and. Uh, <clears throat> yeah so before I, i discuss about you know uh, the rib i thought maybe i'll just give a quick overview of transgenic crops cultivated in india and then take it uh, to the rib so the bt cotton is very very popular in india and the bt cotton was introduced in the year 2002 uh, the uh, the name of the technology was bolgard containing cryonic gene then later on after 4 years another technology called as bolga 2 was introduced uh, uh, for commercial cultivation and uh, this contains uh, two different uh, toxin producing genes namely cryonic and crati ab well we all know that you know bt cotton is very popular in india and that also you know brought a lot of benefits to the growers there are so many reports suggesting the same and uh, one such report published in pnes suggested that there was increase in the yield of up to 24% uh, especially among the you know small uh, scale holders then that also brought in 50% gain in the overall profit this is largely due to you know reduce uh, the spending on plant protection measures 
and uh, report also suggested that uh, you know these benefits were more stable and sustainable because of uh, this huge benefits that farmers get the technology also become very popular over a period of time and at present uh, close to 11.5 million hectares of bt cotton is cultivated in india and that translates to around 95% of the total cotton that is cultivated and uh, all uh, this 95% of the bt cotton contains bone guard to technology well the report uh, then in pns publication year 2009 suggested that benefits are sustainable and more stable but going forward now we realize that those benefits are not actually sustainable because of the evolution of resistance in uh, in insects against these tri toxins well this is a major challenge in india and this is also a major challenge in uh, in other countries but in other countries especially in us and china they have been able to manage the resistance uh, um, in case of gm crops but unfortunately in india we failed uh, miserably to manage resistance development in insects so well uh, before the introduction of uh, bt cotton in india elsewhere around the world scientists proposed various uh, insect resistance management options among them two options are more striking more prominently projected uh, the first one is gene pyramiding and uh, the second one is high dose refuge strategy well what is gene pyramiding uh, it is basically incorporating more than one toxin producing genes to the same plant against and those uh, genes are directed against the same target pest well the idea here is that since the binding receptor sites are different for these toxins even if insect evolves resistance to one particular toxin and that uh, the benefit for the insect is nullified by the expression of another toxin so so therefore uh, that will eventually delay the development of resistance across the world there are several technologies that are available containing more than uh, two toxin a expressing genes incorporated into the plant genome so here you can see some of the technologies uh, with the two genes but in us there are also some technologies in cotton where more than 10 uh, genes have been uh, incorporated into the same plant so one of the major you know benefits that mathematical models suggest by going for pyramided genes is that it significantly delays the development of resistance even with reduced refuge requirements you can see here in this graph that the red line is basically uh, for the bull guard expressing only one particular toxin and here it will take about 20 years to develop resistance at a 10% refuge but if we actually simultaneously incorporate both cryonisa and cryo b toxins into the same plant you know uh, which is uh, nothing but bulga 2 that will take 20 years but almost at no refuge levels and if the refuge is extended uh, then it will take many more years to develop resistance so this is uh, what is uh, <coughs> projected uh, as one of the ipm you know strategies <coughs> sorry arm strategies for mitigating the evolution of resistance in uh, in uh, uh, gm crops another uh, very very widely adopted irm strategy is basically refuge well let me first explain what is a refuge in simple terms a refuge is a area in terms of block or the area around the main cotton field or main transgenic uh, <coughs> crop field that is that is basically planted by the farmers and these plants are planted in the very close proximity with the bt cotton plants so the advantage here is that this strategy will basically help in delaying the development of resistance now let me explain how actually it works so on the right side you can see is a big block that refers to bt crop and the left side is a small block that refers to basically non bt crop or refuge area on bt crops there is a possibility that the small individuals may survive uh, because they have uh, the inherent ability to uh, you know survive and then they are called as resistant individuals and in the absence of refuge if those individuals mate among themselves and the resultant progeny will be basically resistant to tri toxins well the other scenario is now with the refuge now what happens with the refuge is that there are also individuals developing on the 
non bt refuge is nothing but non bt plants and since the plants are not expressing bt toxins there is a high possibility of many individuals developing there as compared to the number of individuals that develop on bt crop and there is also high probability that the resistant individuals will always find mates among the susceptible zygotes that develop on non bt crop and since the inheritance of resistance ear is basically recessive and therefore the resultant progeny is susceptible to cry toxins so when the resistant individual mates with the susceptible individual developing and refuge and it produces offspring which is basically susceptible to cry toxins and therefore when it feeds on the bt cotton in the next generation it is killed and that's how actually we can basically bring down the development of resistance probability here so this is also called as high def, high dose refuge strategy because the expression of toxin in bt cotton is around 20 to 50 times uh, of that of you know lc99 or ld99 values and therefore there is no possibility of survival for this f1 offspring on bt cotton plant and therefore it is called as high dose and refuge when well, the next question is what should be the ideal refuge size there is no uh, uh, exact answer for this because it depends on various factors like it depends on the pest biology and behavior then what is actually extent of natural refuge available in in the country or in the region where the bt crop is cultivated and local cultivation practices and it also depends on socio economic factors so we need to factor in all these things before we decide the actual refuge size so therefore the refuge size varies from country to country and it also varies from the region to region within the country and uh, you can see here on this slide that in case of uh, usa and south africa and also in argentina the refuge is 20% and sprayed meaning the spraying of insecticides is allowed on non bt crop here and if you do not take up sprays then you can actually reduce the refuge size to just 5% whereas in case of australia it is 10% and 5% unsprayed on pigeon pea so there is also alternative host plant that is given here instead of cotton they can also plant their pigeon pea then in china there is no refuge mandatory refuge requirement and they rely largely on natural refuge which is also called as unstructured refuge and mandatory refuge is called as structured refuge when in india the regulation is that uh, the farmer should plant 20% of the non bt around the bt field as refuge or five rows of non bt cotton whichever is larger so uh, hence forth i'll be referring to uh, you know uh, the refuge here as a block refuge in the uh, when i discuss uh, uh, about refuge in relation to uh, you know rib or refuge in bag that i'm going to discuss later okay so this is also called as block refuge because refuge is planted as a block in one side very close to the bt cotton field or it could also be planted around the bt cotton field so to meet this requirements uh, commercial uh, cotton seed bags contain basically two bags one is the bigger bag with 450 grams of uh, you know bt cotton seeds another small pouch of 120 grams containing non bt cotton seeds you can see this here 120 grams of non bt cotton seeds to be used as a refuge well despite of having all these uh, you know strategies in place insects have evolved, uh, eventually evolved resistance in india and in fact what was very surprising here is that the the reports of occurrence of uh, resistance uh, was uh, noticed Uh, as early as in 2011 here but actually it was uh, the, there were also few reports of occurrence of resistance way back in 2009 itself so first report is specific to the development of resistance for cryvaniaceae and the second one is uh, the development of resistance for both the toxins that is for cryvaniaceae as well as cryvaniaceae in india and that was reported in the year 2018 but uh, eventually actually it was reported uh, or uh, people saw the development of resistance way back in 2014 to 2016 well then 
scientists in india and also across the world started discussing about what could be the possible reasons for development of resistance uh, in pbw uh, in india particularly and then finally they hit upon one particular factor that is poor compliance of refuge by the farmers which means farmers did not uh, plant uh, non bt uh, cotton plants uh, as a refuge and therefore that basically led to the development of resistance in pink bollworm and because of this reason some of the scientists also called for revision of the policy related to refuge requirement in india and in the process they proposed to go for refuge in bag strategy with 20% non bt seeds as a the refuge requirement well refuge in bag is also referred to as refuge in seed mix or it is also called as built in refuge so these are the different terms that are related to refuge in bag well the idea here is that the non bt seeds are mixed in uh, the cotton seed bag and uh, both bt and non bt seeds look similar in appearance and therefore farmers will not be able to segregate the non bt seeds from uh, bt seeds and uh, eventually they are going to plant both bt and non bt seeds together and this will ensure the complete compliance like that refuge in bag is nothing it's not a new uh, you know idea it was first approved for bt corn way back in 2010 and uh, if you look at the actual refuge compliance it is around 90% in us which means the refuge in bag was brought in there not to increase the uh, the refuge compliance further but to make it more convenient for the farmers to go for what do you call refuge planting here instead of going for block sowing they can easily go for refuge in bag kind uh, you know what do you call refuge in bag kind of sowing wherein they don't have to make a separate block for the refuge and therefore in in the process they will also maintain the refuge requirements and if you are going for refuge in bag the proportion of non bt seeds that you use is significantly low as compared to refuge that is taken up as a block in fact in certain cases in us the non bt seeds that are mixed in the seed bag are also basically colored you can see in the picture as well so that farmer would actually know what is the proportion of non bt seeds that are mixed in the seed packet then now i actually i am going to discuss a rib or refuge in bag in the context of major insect pests that occur on cotton plant of course bt cotton is basically uh, introduced to tackle bollworm problems there are four different species of bollworms among them two species are are considered as major ones that cause significant damage one is american bollworm helicorpa armishera and the other one is pink bollworm pectinophora gossypiella so what is the possibility of consequences of rib or refuge in bag or helicorpa armishera when this idea was mooted then we argued that this idea could be actually counterproductive in terms of managing the resistance why we thought so is because of the following reasons in case of helicorpa armishera the caterpillars are known to move from one plant to other plant and in its life time each caterpillar would feed around 3 to 4 bolts and if you look at the way we plant uh, the, the uh, you know cotton so most of the in most of the fields we can see branches overlapping with each other and uh, this basically is a high probability because of the lot of emphasis given for high density planting high density planting means we are going to have more number of plants in the same unit area and we need to in that case we basically reduce the spacing between the plants and that basically results in high probability of intermixing or overlapping of the branches of different uh, plants in the neighborhood so you can see here this is what we get to see uh, more often in the cotton field that branches of different plants overlap with each other and now you can imagine the bt plant and non bt plant uh, in the uh, same vicinity and uh, then the larval movement happening between bt and non bt plants so now the question is okay fine the larva are moving from one plant to other plant so what is the impact of it well there is now two possibility here one is the possibility of movement of grown up caterpillars from non bt to bt plants in that case the grown up caterpillars are exposed to 
sublethal doses of the toxin on bt because the toxin that is required for the young caterpillars to get killed is not same for the grown up caterpillars therefore grown up caterpillars normally require you know higher content of uh, the toxin and therefore in that case those caterpillars are exposed to some lethal doses and therefore it can actually lead to evolution of resistance then another scenario would be that in caterpillars when eggs hatch out they the caterpillars move from non bt plant to bt plants in that case the those caterpillars are killed because of expression of toxins in the bt plants well what is the impact of it we basically grow refuse to conserve susceptible zygotes susceptible individuals there when those susceptible individuals are killed then obviously we do not have sufficient number of susceptible individuals for mating and then producing uh, you know uh, the offsprings that are going to be uh, susceptible to the bt toxins so eventually that's going to defeat the very purpose of refuge so in the both the context it appears it may not work well to delay the development of resistance in case of helicorpa armigera now let me discuss what happens when we go, when we have rip in relation to pink bollworm incidence and damage and resistance unlike helicorpa armigera which stays outside the bowl and then feed on the lid pink bollworm usually gets into the bowl it stays within the bowl during its entire larval period and it is a seed feeder it feeds only on the seeds well now we should also discuss uh, uh, in the context of poly kind of pollination that uh, that is the, there in the cotton cotton is considered as a often cross pollinated crop and on a, a general note uh, literature says that there is going to be 5 to 25% cross pollination however there are also some reports suggesting that the extent of cross pollination is up to 60% so what happens when there is a cross pollination between bt and non bt plants in rip system well because of the pollen mediated gene flow between bt and non bt plants we get to see both bt and non bt plants occurring in the same bowl which means the pink bollworm caterpillar is now going to feed on both bt and non bt seeds within the same bowl and that will definitely will lead to increase in the possibility of development of resistance despite of all these risks uh, the government uh, notified uh, the rip strategy or refuge in bag strategy saying that cotton seed packet will uh, will contain 475 grams of seeds and in that 5 to 10% of the seeds should be non bt which means there is a now provision to include up to 10% of the non bt seeds as refuge and these seeds are mixed now in the same bag whereas in the previous case the 120 grams of non bt seeds were available as a separate pouch so we should also now know that in india bt cotton crops are cultivated as hybrids not as varieties as in case of usa so what does it mean basically now we are crossing two different plants and therefore it's very difficult to maintain 100% trait purity trait purity what i mean here is the the percent of you know the bt toxin producing genes present in the seeds when i say 90% it's that in a seed packet 90% of the seeds will have toxin producing genes and remaining 10% could be non bt seeds so these were the guidelines uh, by the government of india which means knowing the fact that it's difficult to achieve 100% trait purity government already gave a cushion during uh, uh, you know block system of refuse to have 10% non bt seeds in the seed packet then what was interesting for us to know here is that uh, before rip uh, came into existence we thought we will basically assess the trait purity that exists in the bt cotton seeds that are sold in uh, uh, india so what we did here is we sampled uh, 78 seed packets uh, around uh, uh, around india uh, basically you know collected in different states and these seed seed packets represented 25 different hybrids basically popular hybrids produced by 15 well known companies so from every seed packet we collected 90 seeds then we analyzed for the presence or absence of cryo-1s and also cryo-2b toxins in them 
So this is the outcome of the study. What it says is that uh, what we noticed rather is that around 93% of the <coughs> seeds had both cryovenase as well as cryodiabi toxins in them. Okay. So here in that case, trend purity is 93%. And 1% each had only cryovenase toxin and or only cryodiabi toxin. And 5% of the seeds did not have any of those toxins, which means they are non bt toxins. And in fact, what was also very interesting to uh, know from our study is that the extent of trait purity varied significantly across uh, different hybrids produced by different companies. And the lowest was 61%, which means 40% of the seeds uh, either did not have any uh, toxin producing genes or had only either one of the genes in them. And 30% of the seed packets had trait purity of less than 90%. So well, this was the initial apprehensions that we all had. Now I'm going to discuss uh, some of the field reports after the implementation of RIP in, in particularly in USA, where it is in practice in BT call. There are several reports talking about evolution of resistance or increase in the rate of resistance in RIP regime as compared to block regime. Due to the paucity of time, I've chosen only two or three uh, studies to talk about here. So one such study is from US here. You can see the challenges for seed mix uh, refuse strategy in BT maize. So what uh, this uh, study suggests is that there is a very high degree of contamination or cross pollination when we go for a rib system as compared to blocked system of refuge. Here, researchers try, uh, try to analyze the contamination in the three different uh, technologies expressing three different types of toxins and uh, <coughs> the highest uh, cross pollination was 55%, which means in case of uh, uh, rib, which means it is a basically non BT plant, 55% of the kernels had BT toxins. So there is a cross contamination between BT and non BT plants here. And in some cases it was 14%, and in another case it was 30%. Overall, what they concluded is that the rib system is unlikely to provide a required refuge population because of the cross contamination. And when there is a larva movement between BT and non BT plants, particularly in this case, irate caterpillar and stock borers, that results in high probability of development of resistance. So it is in a way counterproductive to mitigate or to delay the development of resistance. Similarly, similarly, there are also anecdotal reports suggesting cross contamination in rib system compared to block refuse system. In one such case, scientists have noticed 62% cross pollination on refuge and bag system of uh, refuge as compared to block system. So 62% contamination is very, very high. It is almost equivalent to your planting non bt maize here. And uh, the Pat uh, Porter, uh, who is an extension entomologist in Texas a &M, went on saying that there is a lot of data now available to say that seed mixtures or seed blends in BT along with the BT results in increase in the development of resistance in ear feeding caterpillars. Similarly, there is also another anecdotal report saying that <coughs> reveal basically has up the development of resistance in case of ear red uh, worm or uh, corn ear worm hel hel helicorpa zia. Well, let me discuss now about the seed mixture and its repercussions on insect that feed on BT cotton. This is what is more exciting and interesting for uh, us, isn't it? So here, uh, there is a uh, very good publication published in scientific reports. And one of the authors is Bruce Tavashnik and arguably he is one of the best minds working in the area of you know, insect resistance on genetically modified crops. And what the results say? Well, they did uh, some controlled experiments in polyhouse, planting uh, refuge in black and uh, planting a refuge in rib system, then uh, releasing different types of insects here. GIA is basically Georgia selected, uh, collected, you know, uh, PB, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, Helicorbazia. And uh, GAR is the same insect selected for resistance in the laboratory. And there is a cross between GAR and GA and resultant progeny, uh, progeny was also released on these plants. So what they noticed here is that in case of seed mixture, 
the survival of the population was very high and in case of block system survival of the population was very less so which means there is a high survival percentage because of movement of insects from bt to non bt plants and vice versa and therefore there is a higher survival percentage in case of seed mixture as compared to block system and further they applied this data into the genetic um, uh, population model systems and then they figured out that if you go for basically rib system or refusion back system and uh, that will basically increase the possibility of de development of resistance by 2 to 4.5 folds over block system so this is a kind of conclusive evidence because this is not just a mathematical model it is also based on the empirical evidence the experiments done in polyoses in controlled conditions simulating different systems there might be some differences when we go to the field nevertheless the field situations were simulated here in controlled conditions and they generated these results well in case of uh, pink bollworm in india we all know that it is occurring in very serious proportions in different states where our bt cotton is cultivated and causing devastating losses and this is a cr cr report uh, suggesting very high levels of pbw infestation there is also publication suggesting that pbw has developed resistance and again the occurrence was not confined to particular location of the state but it is widespread it is present in different uh, almost in all the places where our bt cotton is cultivated and occurring in very very serious proportions now we might argue that poor compliance of refuge led to the development of resistance but one of our studies clearly suggests that ever since uh, we went for bt cotton cultivation in india we had a kind of rib already uh, in place because uh, because of you know different kind different uh, you know levels of trait purity that existed in uh, <clears throat> the seed packets and on average it was 5% of non bt seeds that were present uh, across the seed packets that is actually equivalent to the proportion of non bt seeds now proposed in rib requirement yet insect has developed resistance so we need to know ponder as to what went wrong beyond this refuge compliance to just sum up here there are now many field evidences many reports suggesting that refuge in bag actually can be counterproductive it can basically increase the possibility of development of resistance instead of delaying the evolution of resistance and therefore we have to be very very cautious when implementing such strategies but in india already it's being implemented then if you ask me a question will that have any impact on the refuge compliance when i say refuge compliance actual refuge compliance in terms of delaying the development of resistance my answer would be no because of the supporting evidences that we have so far but i do not have direct evidence rather we do not have direct evidence to say that it may not actually uh, be useful but in that case my optimistic answer would be i am not sure about it so that's what i wanted to talk about today and i thank tix for this opportunity and i thank all of you for your patient hearing uh, thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, uh, professor Holy Mohan for very informative talk and uh, revealing how uh, the refuge uh, uh, strategy is not working. In fact, uh, I've seen many farmers they just don't use the refuge packet and continue with that. So thank you very much for pointing it and uh, elaborating strategy. And uh, so now we will uh, go for uh, taking questions uh, uh, and. Uh, further discussions so i'll request my colleague dr sampath kumar to take over from there thank you so much sir uh, uh, as a matter of fact we have just received a lot of questions in the q and a box but uh, we are just resting uh, restricting ourselves for a few questions uh, the first question uh, will be to oh, dr chatter mohli mohan can you stop sharing your the presentation so then uh, yeah the channel can come on the so, yeah perfect thank you very much so uh, one of the questions is uh, the impact of biological control agents is not so immediate so uh, how can we convince the small scale farmers to use these uh, agents as a biological control agent and implement them in their fields and that to in conjunction pest control packages that they are already following 
Um, uh, thanks, Sampath. Uh, I think most of the questions I have answered in the Q&A yeah. box, I think I missed uh, responding to this particular yeah, question. Right. Um, and now, um, basically, uh, what we do is uh, many of the trials uh, are conducted in farmers' fields um, or by involving the farmers in the demonstration trials which are conducted in the universities. So this is one way by which uh, the farmers can be convinced uh, on the usefulness of the strategy which has to be adopted. For example, uh, when the fall armyworm uh, uh, invasion happened in uh, 2018, uh, we had uh, plots in our uh, field campus at Yalahanka and uh, we invited the farmers and we showed them the plot and we even showed them the EPN infected larvae. Um, we could show them the uh, patches uh, on the plants where we have released the virus and how the viral symptom looks like. So by involving farmers in the trials or by conducting demonstration trials in the farmers fields, I think that's the best way to convince the farmers, especially the smallholder farmers. And that's my opinion. Have I responded to your question, Sampath? Yeah, I think I think uh, it's mostly answered. Uh, the other question is to Dr. Uh, Murli Mohan. So uh, most of the cotton growing belt, uh, they are small and medium scale farmers. So uh, with the prices being uh, different for uh, uh, PT cotton and the uh, regular cotton seeds, uh, how will that uh, affect the farmers in choosing uh, the different uh, cotton seeds for growing? And will the small scale farmers be able to have this block set aside for uh, the refuge purpose? Well, uh, in terms of you know, cotton prices, uh, seed cotton, BT cotton seed prices, I think uh, it is uh, at you know, affordable levels. Now, each pack uh, would uh, cost around 800 rupees. Earlier, it was 2500 rupees when it was initially commercialized uh, for commercial cultivation. And now it is 800 rupees and um, um, people are actually buying because it also brings in so much of value to the growers in terms of increasing yield and uh, cutting down the cost of plant production measures. Yeah. And your second question was uh, the refuge, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, there is uh, uh, another publication uh, that has come out this year suggesting that uh, it is a basically a wrong policy uh, in terms of implementing the, uh, the refuge requirement that has led to development of resistance and uh, we should not blame the farmers that's what that's what the publication says and uh, it is from germany uh, however what i feel here is that we just implemented uh, this strategy without uh, doing proper socio economic survey understanding the farmers requirements etc so we should have done that uh, in first place prior to actually introducing or deploying this strategy. What I feel is that many of the farmers are small scale holders. For them, losing 20% of the acreage uh, does matter. So in that case, probably we can think of giving some incentives to the growers who basically go for refuge planting in terms of some monetary benefits or something else and uh, motivating, therefore, in the process, motivating them to go for refuge planting. So there must be some incentives given to the small farmers if they want to go for refuge. In, if you actually do that, probably we can ensure good compliance in terms of refuge planting. That's what I feel. Uh, are there any uh, complaints officers in place when the planting happens? Do anybody go to these fields and are there any complaints officers as such? No, at present there is no such system to basically monitor and then, then ensure the complete compliance. There is nothing like that. Next question is to uh, Dr. Chandish, ma'am. Uh, when, uh, when, whenever there are fluctuations in the pest infestations, so um, how do we maintain these biocontrol agents? So whenever there is a requirement, uh, we need to scale it up, we need to scale it down whenever there are less number of pest infestations happening. So how do we regulate? So for you, you spoke about private players coming into the field and taking this up uh, as uh, one of the uh, solutions for us to go ahead. So if we are to plan this, uh, this would be a highly dynamic situation wherein the pest levels would increase or they would change. So how do we regulate this and what would be the costing of all these things? See, the cost depends on the kind of natural enemy we are looking at. Um, see, basically, if you look at microbials, that is parasitoids and predators, 
there aren't many commercial units who are coming forward uh, one reason being uh, the problem of storage so that's why i um, showed just one example where we have come up with the technology for storage up to 3 months after which you know so that the uh, com commercial producers can plan and produce in such a way that the um, a stockpile of bioagents are ready prior to the requirement so that is one way by which uh, for macrobials you can uh, inspire uh, commercial units uh, as far as biopesticides go you know that is uh, you can store biopesticide like uh, any chemical pesticide and uh, somehow the bigger companies are not coming forward to uh, produce biopesticide so in some of the uh, brainstorming sessions you know i used to uh, mention to the chemical companies if they could produce a couple of biopesticides along with uh, their uh, chemical pesticides so that uh, the science of biocontrol can also uh, be spread and uh, sufficient can be produced if you look at the production of biopesticides you will see that uh, majority of the commercial producers are small companies they are not the um, bigger ones so um, one way is to uh, as i told you biopesticides if you have whether there is a fluctuation and uh, if there is an increase accordingly you can use the biopesticides and for microbials there has to be very good planning you cannot uh, produce or release microbials without planning it is a science in itself so um, i think that is the uh, response and you need uh, research backup so this cannot happen with just a commercial company picking up the technology and trying to do it it should be in a network mode a public private kind of partnership which can help in um, you know the 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 final aim is to see that chemical pesticide load is reduced so i think that's the answer i have Uh, last question for the day uh, probably uh, is there any disadvantage that resistant bollworms will not grow on normal plant uh, why don't resistant insects grow on both bt and normal plant and compete out uh, for normal insects in the refuge processes so this is for dr uh, murli so the basically the question is uh, do we see that uh, re resistant uh, bollworms also grow in normal plant so why can't we have certain blocks wherein they are being grown there resistant inducers correct i didn't get your question uh, i'll just read it out once more yeah, yeah is there a, is there any disadvantage that resistant bollworms will not grow on the normal plant why don't resistant insects grow on both bt and normal plants and compete out normal insects in uh, refuge purposes well resistant inducers can grow on both the plants both bt as well as non bt plants all the insects can breed and develop on non bt plants but only resistant inducers can breed and develop on <coughs> develop on rather breed on bt cotton plants uh, uh, so follow up question would be like that so why can't be there separate blocks being maintained for uh, uh, these plants so so that they are also there and such a <laughs> such cases where the resistance increases not be there yeah in fact you know one of the reasons as to why helicorpa has not developed resistance but only pbw has developed resistance is that there is a alternate refuge available for uh, you know helicorpa or mesand also spodoptera litura in terms of other alternate host plants but uh, for pink bowl worm it is being a monophagous insect no other alternate host plants available and therefore that will lead to inbreeding and then development of resistance well i'll just had uh, uh, one more thing here to mitigate the development of resistance what they have done are basically to address uh, the resistance in pbw in years uh, what they have done is they have went for sterile insect technique wherein they released billions of sterile Uh, males of pink bowl worm using aircrafts in the area where pbw was a major problem and this was done for about 8 years uh, from 2000 uh, you know uh, 6 to 2014 and in the year 2018 they kind of announced that pbw is completely eradicated from that place so we need i think look beyond these things uh, to address this pbw problem in india and certainly there are other options available what i feel is that we when bt was uh, commercialized in india uh we all thought the way it was projected is that it is a panacea and that is a one uh, solution for all the problems that we had but that should have been projected as a one of the components in ipm 
which means we need to integrate all other measures and bt cotton is one of the ipm components and if that was told properly probably we didn't have, we would not have a, this problem now so now i think we need to go beyond refuge and think of other options including implementation of ipm practices to restore the susceptibility i think i think uh, that's it so we are just running yeah, out there of time uh, sampad if you don't mind there is another question in the chat box by uh, dr anjana if you don't mind can i take one minute to answer the sure, question sure 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 the question is that uh, do they have to buy do the farmers rather have to buy bt cotton seeds from agencies every year or they can plant seeds obtained from bt crops next year well uh, dr anjana actually the bt cotton seeds are um, cultivated as hybrids here and if farmers use their own seeds then that will have lot of impurities supposing uh, if they are using bolga 2 uh, seeds of their own then uh, that will have the you know the segregation of seeds in the ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 which means only <coughs> uh, 9 ratio is positive for both 1 ac and 2ab 3 positive for 1 ac and minus for 2ab and vice versa for another 3 and 1 uh, is uh, absent for all the traits so they may not be able to achieve the required right purity if farmers use their own seeds and therefore they always rely on the industry or seed manufacturer uh, uh, to produce the seeds thank you sir i think there is still a lot of questions uh, i just request the uh, participants that uh, all the answers will be mailed back to your personal mail ids uh, on that note we'll just say thank you and i think uh, uh, both the talks were uh, uh, informative and engaging and uh, one of the testimonials is uh, we had a lot of participants and nobody has dropped out and this is quite common in such a platform wherein I, it goes up and it gradually goes down as we come to the end of the talk but in this case uh, we didn't see such dropouts which means to say that both the talks were highly informative engaging and captivating I thank both the speakers and request Rakesh to propose the vote of thanks you have already done that so I my only uh, uh, very pleasant job is to, to thank uh, both uh, Dr. Chandis Vallal and Dr. Uh, Murli Mohan for uh, accepting our invitation and giving fantastic talks which kept uh, 150 people engaged for the uh, past one hour, one and a half hour. And it was very uh, 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 thought provoking also many things that the one side the biological control, the other side the high tech approaches and what are the difficulties and what are the uh, uh, possible solutions and these are something uh, really hot topics and so important for uh, our country I mean whole world but since we have lots of uh, uh, stress on our agriculture and best particularly in this kind of environment it is particularly important that we uh, adopt the best and sustainable technology so that uh, uh, food is available and we don't get into uh, any major difficulties or spoil our environment. So thank you both very much and we'll continue this discussion in various forms and hope that we will work together to come out with let's say, some of the solutions which are so much uh, needed for the society. So and I thank all the speakers uh, uh, along with uh, uh, them, all the participants for registering and participating and putting so many questions. Uh, it's really the Q&A is flooded with that, but we will take care of all the questions and uh, give you the answers after obtaining them from the experts. And with that, I thank uh, everybody who's uh, uh, made arrangements for this webinar and look forward to such stimulating sessions in near future. Thank you all very much and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, Dr. Murli. Thank you, Sampal. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Savita. Thank you, Sham.